Now programming from the Illinois Channel, an independent nonpartisan corporation formed to provide nonpartisan coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. For more information on the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org. Just ahead, we attend a symposium at the National Press Club titled Bicentennial Reflections, Insider Stories on Illinois Leaders and Legacies in Washington. This event, hosted by the Illinois State Society, features Clarence Page, a columnist and editorial writer with the Chicago Tribune, and Lynn Sweet, a columnist with the Chicago Sun-Times, commenting on the more influential Illinois politicians in the recent past, present, and future. And finally in one hour, we attend a panel discussion at the annual conference of the Illinois Association of School Boards titled Legislative Issues Impacting Schools. Speakers include Republican State Representatives Bob Pritchard and Thomas Bennett, Democrat State Senator Scott Bennett, and Tony Smith, the State Superintendent of Education. That's all just ahead, after a brief word from one of our advisory council members. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, President of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. Since 1985, we've worked to educate the public and those who serve as trustees and pension boards about issues that impact the financial health of publicly funded pensions. Our members manage over $18 billion in pension assets. That's a huge number. But we never forget those dollars belong to the men and women who've worked as firefighters, police officers, and as educators. We want them to know that their pension dollars are safely invested. They also want to know that someone will keep an eye on legislation that could threaten their pension. And that's why the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association is fighting against laws that would reduce the pensions earned by our members. And this is why we support the work of the Illinois Channel. Their unbiased, in-depth coverage of the pension reform issue allows us and our members to hear arguments on both sides of the pension issue. To follow legislation as it moves through committee, or to hear unedited interviews with key lawmakers as they discuss what changes are being considered. Pensions are very important. They're also very complex. Pension reform can't adequately be covered in sound bites. But the Illinois Channel provides a connection to the Capitol, the governor, and lawmakers that we all need to stay on top of key issues. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, president of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. I watch the Illinois Channel, and I hope you do too. As Illinois approaches its bicentennial celebration, the Illinois Channel takes a look at the people, events, and landmarks that make up Illinois' rich history. Next, from Washington, D.C., we attend a symposium at the National Press Club titled Bicentennial Reflections, Insider Stories on Illinois Leaders and Legacies in Washington. This event, hosted by the Illinois State Society, features Clarence Page, a columnist and editorial writer with the Chicago Tribune, and Lynn Sweet, a columnist with the Chicago Sun-Times, commenting on the more influential Illinois politicians in the recent past, present, and future. This runs about one hour. Uh, we're so glad to have such a wonderful turnout for this uh, special program that we have, sponsored by the Illinois State Society, to begin and kick off the Illinois State Society's bicentennial celebrations of 200 years of Illinois statehood. You know, we want to give a special welcome to everyone who's in attendance, to all those who are viewing this, this event. Uh, we have a special program to highlight the political contributions, uh, the contributions of Illinois political leaders uh, here in Washington and their legacies. We have a distinguished panel. Uh, folks that we've gotten to know over the years, uh, who we watch on television, who we listen to on the radio, who we read on a daily basis. Uh, we're very pleased that Lynn Sweet with the Chicago Sun-Times, Clarence Page with the Chicago Tribune are serving as our panelists, and our moderator tonight is Ellen Shear, who is dean of the Medill School of Journalism and also serves as the Washington Bureau Chief uh, for Medill, Medill News Service, affiliated with Northwestern University. You know, as the Illinois State Society, we can take so much pride in the fact that the Illinois State Society is the oldest state society in the history of Washington, D.C. And over our 163 years, we've enjoyed the participation of so many distinguished 
historical figures such as Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen and Barack Obama. We've celebrated the fact that we've had four presidents from Illinois, two vice presidents, and three speakers of the House. So, so, so much that we celebrate. We have a thousand members. We celebrate a lot of activities. We get together on a regular basis. We share our own personal experiences coming from Illinois or our ties to Illinois, but we also celebrate the history, the culture, and the uh, cheer on our sports teams, too, uh, from Illinois. We particularly uh, want to thank our partners for this special event, uh, Molina Healthcare, Medill School of Journalism, Southern Illinois University, the Illinois Channel, C-SPAN, and also the Illinois State Foundation uh, for their contribution and partnership in supporting this special event. As a native of Dwight, Illinois, it's my privilege this year to be president of the Illinois State Society, and it's an honor for me to have that. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to our panelists and our hosts, and let's begin our program. Ellen. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm very excited um, to be hearing from two Illinois treasures this evening, uh, Lynn Sweet and Clarence Page. And we'll be talking about politics, um, possibly policy, certainly uh, maybe a little Illinois trivia thrown in. But tonight is everything Illinois. Uh, starting with our panelists. So let me uh, introduce you first to Clarence Page. Let me tell you a little bit about him. As you know, he is a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, and his column is nationally syndicated. He's also a member of the Tribune's editorial board. Um, he has been with the Tribune. Uh, he first joined the Tribune uh, right out of college, and has always come back to the Tribune. He did leave the Tribune for a stint in the Army. I felt safer knowing that Clarence was protecting the Western United States from all enemies from the press office. Um, he also uh, left the Tribune briefly uh, four years to uh, be at WBBM television, um, but came back to the Tribune. Uh, he has won Pulitzer Prize, a Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1989 for commentary and in 1972 for a series on voter fraud. Um, he also has written several books, Showing My Color, Impolite Essays on Race and Identity, and A Bridge to the New Media Century. Um, you've seen him on television, you've seen him at the, uh, well, maybe you haven't seen him at the Gridiron, but he is a longtime member of the Gridiron and a terrific singer, and I just feel really lucky to uh, get to talk politics with him tonight, and I feel the same way about Lynn Sweet, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of the Chicago Sun-Times. She's uh, covered politics and government in Chicago uh, for years and then moved here in, uh, to Washington in 1993. Um, she uh, was named a fellow at Harvard University's Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School in uh, 2004. She uh, currently is president of the Gridiron here in Washington, an active and um, uh, and, and longtime member of Journalism and Women's Symposium and a past president of the Washington Press Club Foundation. I should also note that uh, she's in the Chicago Journalism Hall of Fame and the Medill Hall of uh, Achievement as a Medill alum. So enough about these two guys. Um, now let's get them to talk politics. Before we get into the storied history of Illinois politics, let's talk about today. We uh, have an Illinois member who resigned. Maybe not a complete surprise, but somewhat surprising. Clarence, what's your take? 
Well, I, I, uh, I mentioned to you before the program, I can't wait to talk to uh, Luis Gutierrez to, uh, to get an idea of, of, of uh, why he decided to, to leave. Now, I, I find it to be, be rather poignant. I've known him a long time, and uh, he's been an activist for years and years. Uh, and uh, uh, he's been, uh, he, uh, he made himself a leading figure in the immigration debate nationwide. Right. And uh, there's, there's people throughout the immigration activism community who are, who, who are singing the blues tonight uh, over his departure. And I can't help but, but wonder uh, what the um, current dominance of Republicans in Congress and the White House uh, may have to do with his decision. I still right. view Luis as, as a young man who, who could stick around uh, for, to uh, perhaps wait for another administration to come in, and maybe people will be more friendly toward comprehensive immigration reform, and, and he could get a, a, a new stature that way. Um, but uh, for now, I... Um, uh, don't know what uh, plans he's got. He did say that he, he, he's leaving the Congress, but he's not planning to retire, uh, right. I, which doesn't surprise me because right. uh, he's got too much energy uh, for that. Uh, and also the fact that um, uh, uh, Chewy uh, uh, Garcia, um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, who was a, a longtime uh, activist in Chicago, also a former mayoral candidate, uh, is running for his seat. And apparently this is like you know, Luis passing it on, so to right. speak. Right. Uh, both of them were very key in the Harold Washington campaign back in the 80s when he right. was uh, reaching out to the Hispanic community and all. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm, uh, I, I wish him well. Can't wait to, to, to get the rest of the story. Yes, yes. Lynn? I covered Luis from the beginning when he won the... Uh, his aldermanic seat when Harold Washington was mayor, giving Mayor Washington the control of city council, 26th Ward race, and I've been following him up until last night. Now, I wrote a story years ago when he told me he was going to retire, and then he decided not to, and then all the rumors went flying <coughs> last night, and now I guess it's true. So when he leaves Congress in January of 2019, it will mark 25 years, he's 60-something. He has a great pension. He will have a second and third act in him. I, too, want to know why he, usually, why he didn't signal this beforehand and what was going on with the filing of the petitions. So it's rare that he doesn't stage manage stuff better. He is a pretty master of that. But like Clarence, I want to see if there is a story behind the story because it is rare that everyone is really surprised in Chicago politics. But Luis did the perfect head fake he filed his nominating petitions. <laughs> it, it certainly caught a lot of people by surprise, I think. Um, there's been some suggestion that uh, his, he really wants to go and help uh, Puerto Rico. Do, do you think that really could be the real reason, and it's that simple? I, I think he, you know, he's a grandfather. Uh, the next two years aren't going to be fun for his main... He, he could do what he's doing in immigration reform in or out of Congress. He, he will be a force one way or the other, and he knows his way around. Uh, so he has a home in Puerto Rico. He spent years there. I, I'm not ruling out that maybe he moves there and runs for, you know, for governor there or something. But I think he has a lot of other options, too, including private sector. I, he's very good on TV. I wouldn't be surprised if he has some t ends up with some TV show out of this. See, see, after 25 years, there's other things you could finally do. 25 years plus the, he, in Congress, plus the years in city council. And he also does real estate. So <laughs> maybe he has a deal somewhere. How about running for mayor? I think he ruled by making the deal with Chewy, who ran against Rahm Emanuel last time. Uh, I would think even for uh, Chicago, where everyone likes to move the chess pieces around, if he wanted to run for mayor, uh, you're suggesting then that the, this was part of a deal to trade jobs? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think at this point that is what Luis would want for his next act, especially since he does want to spend so much time Just in, in case. Puerto Rico. I, I Everybody so, in you know, the audience... Yeah doesn't know who Chewy is. Do you oh, want to just... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, just, okay. just say it. Chewy Garcia is a Cook County board member who ran for mayor against Rahm Emanuel last time around. And he remains a popular figure in Illinois. He comes out of the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. 
Yeah, and uh, his real name is Jesus, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Which us old timers forget sometimes. But uh, right. uh, it's a. Uh, but no, I agree with you as far as the mayoral office uh, uh, or mayoral campaign goes. I just wanted to test you to see if you had a scoop you were sitting on that I didn't know about. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but it's a. Uh, They'll never tell, right? <laughs> no, they will never tell. Uh, but uh, I. Uh, uh, Tend to wonder about uh, uh, that uh, possibility, uh, but or, or just what he's going, going to do. One thing about Jesus, uh, when he ran for for a, a mayor, that I found uh, striking was a uh, very smart uh, man, uh, not a great stimulating speaker, uh, and that was uh, that uh, hurt him to some degree. I remember on the night of his acceptance speech, I was telling Ellen earlier, on the night of his acceptance of the nomination, the crowd could not have been more excited, and he got up to the podium and um, uh, gave his speech. And the longer he spoke, the quieter the crowd got, uh, which reminded me of the old line about uh, he gave a fireside chat and the fire went out. <laughs> I really saw it happen that night. And I said, oh, he's going to be in trouble. And uh, indeed, um, uh, uh, Rom's not the, um, the most uh, what, uh, uh, gifted orator in the world, but he's passionate. And he, he said, I'm going to campaign in every precinct, every L stop, blah, blah, blah. And he did. He, uh, he worked hard for it and uh, uh, pulled off in a, mess, a stunning landslide, I think, uh, for the city. Uh, it would go back a long way to get a, a landslide yeah. like that for our first election and, and without a machine behind it, so to speak. But we'll see. So today's headlines, ripped from today's headlines, Illinois in the news. Um, Rahm Emanuel is a good example, though, of Illinois has been in the news for a long time in terms of political leaders. I'm going to briefly remind you of things I'm sure you remember, but uh, Illinois uh, is home to three presidents who were living in the state when they were elected, uh, Lincoln, Grant, and of course, uh, President Obama. Uh, Ronald Reagan was born in Illinois. Congressional leaders, uh, where, where to stop? From Rahm Emanuel to Dick Durbin to uh, Tammy Duckworth to uh, Bob Michael, Dennis Hastert, uh, Dirksen, Cannon, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, the Stevensons, um, Adelaide running for uh, president, the Dailies, uh, uh, LaHood, the, the list goes on and on, of course. In fact, uh, the Medill School of Journalism is named after uh, former Chicago uh, Mayor Joseph Medill. So uh, the list really does go on and on. Um, you guys know a lot more about Illinois than I do. I'm from Wisconsin, uh, sorry. Um, but and you've also been, you know, just enmeshed in Illinois politics for a long time. So I'm going to ask you, Clarence, who who is your most memorable or fascinating uh, Illinois politician to cover? To cover. To cover. Uh, I was going to say Joe Medill, but you, but you said the <laughs> cover. I'm not, I'm not quite that old, but <laughs> Medill's one guy we both work for. In yeah. Your way to, in the, but uh, uh, just uh, uh, among those I've covered, well, uh, of course, uh, uh, Barack Obama's easy, uh, but I um, uh, first met him when he was a state legislator, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, political advisor, David Axelrod, who was a, a former intern of mine at the Tribune back in the 70s, as I point out to anybody who doesn't know the news in Washington, I tried to tell everybody, <laughs> but uh, uh, he, uh, to, to see his campaign rise, uh, I w it was fascinating to watch the parallels with, with Harold Washington's campaign. I, w I won't go, go into all of, of, of um, the history of both, but it was intriguing to, to me because we're talking about an African-American political pioneer uh, at a certain time in history when uh, things came together. There were no guarantees of, of, of anything, but uh, uh, to watch it all uh, build up uh, from the bottom, Chicago, Illinois, and the rest of the country uh, was um, infinitely fascinating. And I think um, he has left a, a mark on the office that we won't really... Uh, be able to uh, fully measure for a while yet, but um, I, I note the the uh, durability of uh, the ACA, Obamacare. 
<laughs> it's fascinating to me because uh, uh, he uh, was dedicated to that idea, and, and so was the Democratic Party in a lot of ways, but, but he made it happen. Uh, we, we've been trying to get, uh, somebody's been trying to get national health care since Teddy Roosevelt, and uh -huh. uh, he, uh, he finally made it happen, and um, uh, it caught the Republicans off guard in terms of, uh, of uh, when they were suddenly thrust into uh, power over both Congress and the White House, uh, they didn't have the the preparation to, they didn't have their ducks in the road to, to, uh, to um, uh, fulfill the, their promise of uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare, uh, which shows you just how far apart the parties are now ideologically in, in their orientation. Um, the, I expect the Republicans to be much more successful at cutting taxes. As uh, uh, my friend Tucker Carlson uh, says, um, what's the joy of being a Republican if you can't cut taxes? <laughs> so uh, the very fact that they're even having divisions over tax cutting shows you yeah. something about yeah. uh, the nature of, uh, of uh, 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 our current political um, landscape. And so I think in a lot, lot of ways, Obama was a, uh, a, a pioneer and a trendsetter. Yeah, yeah. Lynn? Well, certainly covering the rise of Barack Obama was uh, an incredible historic and repertorial experience. But I bring up someone else then who was just very interesting to cover, and that was Dan Rostenkowski. Oh, yeah. He was, he was, he was the House Ways and Means Committee chair when I came here at the end of September, or the beginning of September in 1993. And I didn't really know a lot of, I knew no one. I, came in, I'm new in town, covered politics in Chicago, so I kind of knew him. I once when he, I just had a, a flashback, I covered from the Chicago on one of his re-election campaigns and I went to a um, coffee at a home in a neighborhood called Lincoln Park in Chicago, all these well-heeled people, and all they wanted to know from him if, in whatever, uh, I think they were doing the 86 tax law then, last time we did a big tax bill, and all people wanted to know from this great power, the ear of the president, the drinking buddy of everybody, are we going to keep the passive tax credit in the bill? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he was a storyteller. He wasn't afraid to give an opinion. He was candid, he was insightful, and he was a player. Now, the story sometimes, if you're on deadline, went on, and you could never cut him off. You couldn't do that. Now, I know how he ended. We know how the story ended. Uh, but the time when I came and covered him in the early 90s was before he got in trouble. I, uh, and let me just put another kind of point here. In my time in Washington, I have seen the rise and the fall of This Dan. could be a long list. Well... It's a list, okay? <laughs> so you all know who I'm going to mention, right? Dan Rostenkowski, Rod Bogoyevich, Jesse Jackson Jr., and Aaron Schock. Uh, all people that had great promise, and really Rostenkowski uh, is an enduring figure politically because by the time he got into trouble, he already had a lot of his legacy established. But what is interesting is that he could make a deal happen because he had relationships. You've read about this for years, how it used to be. So I came in at the very tail end of how it used to be. You know, Bob Michael was in, in the house, and because they thought the end result was supposed to be a deal, they would uh, make compromise, do some horse trading. They also had earmarks, which was the great lubricant. But anyway, so I kind of got a little bit of a ringside seat in a way, actually, that Barack Obama did not offer. He was very reserved, very cool, very uh, played it close. So I think as a newcomer in Washington, covering Rusty was something that uh, provided good stories, insight, had a local angle with a figure who was still a towering national figure. And he loved to teach <laughs> and <laughs> preach. Yes. Oh, my gosh, one time. I was at uh, some restaurant, and he was telling a story. And some reporter, and maybe it's a story that everyone had heard three times, but it didn't matter. Every time he told it, it sounded wonderful and fresh. And this reporter cut him off, said, yeah, yeah, we heard this. And the look <laughs> he gave, and he said something, don't you ever cut me off 
and he might have used a stronger word, in the middle of a story. <laughs> when I was growing up, I thought that uh, the, the, the word powerful was part of the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee's <laughs> title. Yeah. Because that's what newscasters always said, no, Chairman of the Powerful House Ways and Means Committee. When I met Dan Rosnikowski, I realized what <laughs> it is part of the title, because he really yeah. had the power and knew how to, how, how to wield it. And uh, uh, so, so did Bob Michael in a different way, from, yeah. from a minority point of view. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take over. <laughs> but that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, I, I certainly think, you know, I don't, was President Obama is, is who he is. Is he a reserved, cool person just by nature? Com but, you know, that idea of saying, I think you said Rostenkowski had opinions and would express them. And today, every, there's a lot more guardedness in most offices, not necessarily all offices. Right. Um, but uh, I just wonder if that has to do a little bit with there's, uh, there is just less kind of camaraderie. And so, you know, knowing every word will be used against you, there, there's well, my opinion. Isn't this a famous opinion. story? And I'm sure some of you know this. Uh, Rostenkowski, and wasn't it Bob Michael would drive back to Illinois together? Right. That's right. Which you, I mean, there were airplanes back then, but they, uh, <laughs> they, enjoyed it. they, they enjoyed made it. road trips all the time. That's and right. that, you know, you, you get work done. The other thing is, I think it's very hard to compare Obama and Rostenkowski because Obama was only in Congress two years of half that time he was running for president and the half of the other time he was writing another book. So he never really did any legislative work in the way that a committee chairman would do it year in and year out for a very long mm -hmm. time. Well, the people talk a lot about how Obama didn't like politics, which was remarkable for a guy who was as successful as he was. But look at the Democratic Party now. He didn't engage in party building either during, the time, during his eight years in yeah. office. And a lot of folks in the party resent that uh, now. But I think it's just in, in his nature. He just was not into that. I mean, I never saw him so happy as when he was out there surfing after he was out of office. Or well, you know, it's interesting. We're talking now 25 years after the death of Harold Washington. Mm -hmm. 25, 30. No, no, it's more. It, uh, 30. Uh, it's Hold on. 30 it's this now, week. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was 77. 30 this week. Yeah. Okay, and we're kicking off the bicentennial for Illinois. And some of these themes kind of, I think as we talk, you know, it's not a real long time when you think of the span of some of the, you know, people in the Rotskankowski is just one generation removed from mm -hmm. other historic figures uh -huh. uh, here in, in, the, in the story of Illinois in the capital. Well, we've talked about some of the people you've covered. How about, um, and maybe this is the same person, but what have been some of the big impacts that you feel Illinois lawmakers have made? Or is there one uh, towering figure, you know, um, Cannon, or, you know, who, what have been the big contributions from the Illinois delegation? Well, for me, uh, Everett Dirksen was an early influence. I, um, I'm old enough, I remember, by the way, when a lot of black folks were, were Republican. Uh, it's hard for young people to believe now. Uh, but uh, uh, indeed, the, the party of Lincoln was a real thing. And, and uh -huh. when I was growing up in, in the 50s, uh, I uh, remember uh, when, uh, well, I, I think it, it was the Little Rock Nine that, that really gave me a political consciousness. I, I was about 10 or 11 years old at the time. Uh, and uh, I, I remember the uh, Arkansas National Guard keeping the black students out of Central High School one day on television, on our black and white TV there at home. Uh, and uh, uh, the next day I turn on the tube and there is the uh, uh, airborne escorting black students into the high school. I turn to my parents and I say, what happened? And my dad says, President Eisenhower. And I thought at that point, President Eisenhower was, was the job title. I, and I said, well, who will be the next President Eisenhower when this one's gone? <laughs> you know? But that's just how large Eisenhower was in my consciousness and a lot of other people at the time. Dirksen was the same way. I followed, I, I was like when starting high school when the civil rights debate was going, civil rights bill debate was going on there uh, in 64. Uh, and um, I remember uh, uh, Everett Dirksen and uh, Charlie Halleck uh, was on the Democratic side. They used to, they called it the Ev and Charlie show. Some, some folks may remember uh, this. Uh, but that's why you invite an old guy like me to take you back in time. Uh, but um, I, I never forget, Dirksen was such a towering figure, uh, really uh, uh, broadcast leadership 
and authority and confidence. And uh, uh, I'll never forget uh, David Brinkley uh, described his voice as uh, akin to a chorus of corduroy pants. <laughs> uh, which uh, any of you go, it's got to be on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. You haven't heard, if you haven't heard Dirksen, tune in and listen to him. He was, he, he was a magnificent guy. Uh, but uh, watching that debate take place at home, you know, the Southern Democrats were keeping the Civil Rights Bill from uh, getting debated and passed. And it was Dirksen led the Republicans, uh, Northern Republicans, land of Lincoln, uh, in that spirit. Uh, to uh, to uh, get, get the bill passed. So uh, I, um, uh, and, and, and uh, years later, I was working with um, uh, Sissy Baker, uh, mm -hmm. Everett Dirksen's uh, granddaughter, right. who uh, was our, uh, in charge of our uh, uh, Tribune broadcasting here in Washington for a, a, a while. And uh, I uh, uh, went over to her and personally, I said, I want to personally thank you on behalf of your grandfather. <laughs> you know? And she said, it's happened before. I'm sure it has. Uh, but uh, no, he was like a, kind of a giant. I think about people like that when I look at Congress today, and um, I, I, I like a lot of people. I, I like Paul Ryan, and uh, I, um, I find um, uh, a lot to like about Miss McConnell, believe it or not. Uh, but um, uh, I, I don't see the leadership happening uh, in Congress today. At the same time, and you alluded to this earlier, there is we're in a different atmosphere today where uh, party organization isn't what it used to be. Uh, a House and Senate organization and leadership uh, isn't what it used to be. The dynamics are, are very different. So right. uh, I don't know what, when that's going to change, but they're still working on it. Uh, I'm still waiting for Congress to produce something this year. <laughs> you know, if we, if we get to the whole year without them producing any major legislation, that'll be a history in, in itself. Mm. Yeah. Your turn. So we're, we want another towering figure, but I think Let's look at how we measure towering figures. And I think if we go no further than Capitol Hill, and if you look at the jury of their peers, the fact that a House building is named after a cannon and the Senate office building is named after Dirksen, when you think of all the people that have served in the House and Senate since the beginning of this nation, and two out of those six buildings are named for Illinois, and I think tells you how history of the Congress, how the people who served under the dome thought of these two figures that were towering in their time uh, came. But I just also wanted to share a, a, a little sense I had of how long I have been involved in, uh, in covering this and my first kind of glimpse of how Illinois history was brought home. So one of the things that we've alluded to tonight and one of the famous political families in Illinois is the Adlai Stevenson family. Of course, Adlai I was the 23rd Vice President of the United States under Grover Cleveland. And then his son, he was the grandfather of Adlai II, who ran for president in 1952 and 1956. So now I'm a young reporter in my Medill, Washington quarter, working for the Alton Telegraph and the Southern Carbondale, <laughs> Southern Illinois. And so the senator at the time was Adlai III, who served between 1970 and 1981. So I walk into his office. And it looked to me like a room out of the Chicago Historical Society, because there were pictures of Adlai Stevenson, there were buttons elect Adlai. And then I realized he just wasn't a collector of political paraphernalia. This was his family. <laughs> It was kind of the same way when I was once invited to uh, Ethel Kennedy's home for some event with uh, one of her children. And I so thought, I walk in there and I know everybody on the wall. Uh, so I think that kind of deep sense of an Illinois history that existed before me and was playing it forward is something that I thought was just a kind of a remarkable, uh, it made a remarkable imprint on me at the time. But when you look at other historic figures, in his own way, and I know he came to a tragic end, and I, I didn't name him on my uh, list of people before, and you know who now I'm also going to, to, make, to add that, is Denny Hastert, the longest serving Republican speaker. Uh, I used to joke, and it's a sad one, I cover people from announcement to indictment. Uh, and uh, this is one that during his reign in Congress, he really fashioned a speakership that kind of set the tone for a lot of what we see today, that the governing party is the majority of the majority, 
Uh, you don't compromise. And in a sense, under President Bush, I thought that Hastert thought of himself as a complementary power, not necessarily a complete competing or a rival one. So it was a very different managerial mm -hmm. style that you saw evolve. Uh, and when I think of the tragic ends of all the figures I have covered, uh, I think when you ask about Illinois history, I think the end of Denny Hassert is perhaps the most uh, sad and tragic and stunning end of anyone who's come out of uh, Illinois to become an important person in the capital on it. So I, I think when you look at the whole picture here, uh, you know, you have these rise and falls. But the, um, I think the sense of proud Illinoisans, when you look at the, uh, the dynasties that have come here in some ways with our delegation, uh, the Jacksons, the Lipinskis, Alderman mm -hmm. Mel made sure that, you know, Bogoyevich got in when um, George Collins got killed in a plane crash at Midway. Cardis Collins replaced him. So you do see a lot of that in our delegation as time has gone on, too. And one other thing about the power of Illinois, I just looked this up because I bet there are people here that know this. At our peak, we had 27 seats in the House, and we peaked in 1943. And when you talk about the influence of Illinois, it diminishes not only because we don't have, for the moment, except for Dick Durbin, who is a who is a major figure within the party, both within the Illinois Democratic Party and the National Democratic Party. Now, we've gone from 27 at a high to now 18, and we might lose another seat after this census. When you think of how come we might not have as many people that are powerful, where we just don't have as many shots, you know, chances of bringing people in and up that we uh, used to, which I think is just kind of mechanically a result of the shrinking Illinois population. And the expanding population elsewhere in the right. country. Right, right, right. But you have talked about a lot of uh, Illinois politicians and, and the impact. It's, it's really, um, I guess I hadn't remembered all of the names that you were talking about. Um, I'm wondering what, what makes... A, you know, the Illinois delegation, is there a, something like, the, how are they unique from the main delegation? Or, well, that's a small delegation, but another, you know, Massachusetts delegation. Is there something about Chicago and Illinois politicians that, that separates them? Uh, certainly Chicago politics is, uh, has a kind of a reputation around the country, I think, as brawling at the very least. Oh, sure. Yeah, my favorite line came from George Will, uh, that uh, Chicago's the only city that associates the Feast of St. Valentine's with a massacre. <laughs> and um, that pretty well describes the political atmosphere. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Remember, we'll, but, we'll be here all week. Thank you. And remember, back in the day, I think Clarence remembers this, only here, this isn't central to your question, but uh, only in Illinois, and specifically in Chicago, would it be a promotion, and as it was in the case of Roman <laughs> Paczynski, it was a promotion to step down as a member of Congress to become an alderman. <laughs> I remember the, 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 the news conference. Were you there when he announced he was doing this? Because there was a, uh, I remember some, some reporter, uh, well, so a Chicago reporter said, Roman, why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why why do you want to leave Congress? And he, he said, Congress, that's only national. <laughs> so any ward boss in Chicago knows where the real cloud is, right? <laughs> and and do you see a difference between what's upstate and, and what downstate? What what are the what are the differences of issues? What how do the uh, members um, work together or work separately? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know what struck me, I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk about this because you've had more experience with the day-to-day -day over there, but, but uh, I noticed, I'm trying to remember how long ago it was, I think it was like in, yeah, back in the 90s, at, I was covering the Democratic Convention and, uh, I'm sorry, the Republican Convention, uh, when uh, I went to a, to a reception afterwards and, and just uh, in talking with uh, Illinois Republicans, uh, how 
moderate and sensible my Illinois friends seem to be <laughs> compared to uh, a lot of the folks from more conservative states. Uh -huh. uh, and it was, it was the beginning of the change of atmosphere that we have seen happen here in, in Washington since the early 90s, uh, more polarized and all. Uh, but um, I, I remember um, uh, later talking to Paul Simon, uh, the senator, not the singer. Uh, and uh, I... I I, you know, I just moved to Washington, and, and I said, you know, it's rather striking to me how um, uh, quiet and low-key people are here. And, and he said, well, Clarence, you know, uh, I'm doing my Al Franken imitation now. Uh, but, uh, well, Clarence, you know, uh, this is a small town, and you, you can hardly stretch your elbows out without poking somebody in the ribs. So everybody <laughs> tries to be civil to each other. You know? And that was about the time he was deciding to leave the Senate. Uh, and um, indeed, things got, not just because of him, but, but things uh, have gotten less civil ever since. That was the rise of Newt Gingrich period yeah. there. Oh, yeah. And that, that was a kind of, of um, Republican and Democratic politics that, that I did not see uh, in Illinois. But it, Illinois seemed to be more concerned with, with folks back home. Uh -huh. and, and, and I don't know how true that still is, but that was uh, my impression early yeah. on. Lynn, your thoughts? <laughs> so I came at the end, as I said, uh, uh, I came at the beginning of September 93. And it was a given that the delegation buried the axe when it came to any Illinois issue, especially soybeans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that has deteriorated. It used to be a great tradition that when there was an Illinois lunch, and it was always hosted by the senior member from Illinois, it would either be Hastert, now it's Durbin, that all the members would come. They would maybe pass around member letters, they would chat about issues in common, and right now ho Durbin hosts these lunches, and it really is just mainly the Democrats who come. Now, when Mark Kirk was the senator, he was a big believer in these joint events, and he would come, but the, yeah, right now the delegation is 11-7, 11 11-7, 11 seven, seven Republicans, and this sense of uh, being part of a more cohesive Illinois uh, entity just isn't there anymore. And I do date this unraveling to when uh, Hastert was speaker and Rahm Emanuel came to Washington and he was immediately installed as the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee whose job it was to take back the House, which would have toppled Denny. So you had these combustible personalities and it kind of was the beginning of uh, of an era that we're in now where I just don't see people getting together. Now, the other thing that I think makes a big difference, I'm going to use the word earmark again. When you had earmarks, the lubricant that used to make this town work, a delegation kind of had to work together because there was always somebody, we always had somebody who was the power that you would go to, Rosty, Denny, whatever. Uh, a quick side pivot. Every reporter who covers local news wants to know what are the projects coming out of the committee or what are this, what are that. It's like, what a waste of time. I just got to get the list of earmarks because nothing was done. And whatever you thought the process was, it, it's like, no. You got to get the list of what the real list is. But So I think some of this is when you have, uh, you, you didn't need to have these transactions. Mm -hmm. And I think they were productive in that it forced people to uh, discuss, you know, I can't give you everything, I could give you this, what do you need? And, and I, I think it made uh, more comedy. On the other hand, I cannot, uh, there, there is such, between the Obama years and now the Trump years, there is such polarization, it's hard to think of what issue, what Illinois issue would bring them together in a way that, that you could work. It, it wouldn't be a policy issue, like the tax bill, it would probably be if there was some project that everybody thought was a good idea. Uh, like infrastructure repair? Well, not, not in general. That would be too. Mm -hmm. It would be like to land a big, another Fermilab or some big national uh, entity, preferably near Chicago or in Chicago, <laughs> which would make it easier. <laughs> because when you ask about the downstate, upstate, well, there is such a, you know, and I am obviously, as a Chicago reporter, uh, have see things through that lens, but there is so much of the congressional power, even with the Republicans in control, does seem to be in the hands of Democrats who are the most active right now in Illinois, even if they don't have power. I mean, 
the Republicans and the delegation just are not from, they, they have their, most of them are not from Chicago except for Kinzinger and Roscom uh, and Randy Hulkren. So the other four just are not really in the consciousness. But my point being, I bet if there was an issue, I don't know what it is right now, and some of you might be involved in them and can tell me later, that there was a need to uh, rally around. Now, the other thing that's very unusual now is that we have a governor who is almost totally disengaged from Washington. Rahm Emanuel, who is a creature of Washington, worked in the White House, he knows where the money is. Okay, so, so a lot of times, as, you all, as everyone in our viewers might know, you don't necessarily get a line appropriation for something. You figure out if you want more money for mass transit, you rework the formulas, whatever. So Rahm knows about that. And usually you have, in years past, we had a governor and a mayor working together, even of different parties. When George Ryan was the governor, he worked very well in Washington with Daley. They used to come, I remember one year there was a joint meeting. They came to meet with the delegation, and there is, you know, the book, here's what we'd like, here are the programs, priorities. It's like, whoa, it's been a while since we have seen that. So uh, Rauner has been in Washington once, and it was shortly after he was elected and before he was inaugurated. And he has gone out of his way, and I've written about it, as have others, not to comment about any federal issue pending. So that is a loss in the way of another player and another voice that we're used to hearing from, from Illinois. Hmm. Well, that actually, um, I, I was going to ask you guys, who are the, who should we be watching? Who is the next Obama, so like to speak? Rising power yes. to rise. Yeah, I mean, the... is it uh, Garcia? Is he uh, the next person to watch? Who, who, who are, who do you see as um, the future of Illinois politics? That's a good question. I have two names to throw out: a oh, Democrat okay. and a Republican. Uh, I think the two people who are the most ambitious and have statewide potential to run on the Republican side is Adam Kinzinger. And on the Democratic side is Sherry Bustos. Oh, Sherry Bustos. Oh, yeah. From Rockford? Uh, she's from northwestern Illinois. Uh, she is in Democratic leadership now, Adam Kinzinger, military. Uh, both have different backgrounds, but they have, I think, the kind of ability to get to be known around the state. Kinzinger is one of the rare Republicans who I see on CNN and MSNBC and Fox. And it's not a lot of, you know, some Democrats won't do Fox, some Republicans won't do MS. So Kinzinger uh, is, I think, somebody who, if, uh, if, if we were making a list of who from the delegation might make a move at some point, uh, I'd put those two on the list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clarence, any thoughts on who are uh, the up-and-comers at the local or, or at the, Washington at, level? That's, that's a very good question. I've been so depressed lately over the lack of leadership, <laughs> and uh, particularly on, I'm, on I'm the... I'm going to try to pull the, you uh, out of it. Well, well particularly on, on the Democratic side, because they just uh, have, have uh, lapsed too long in developing young talent, and uh, they're very well aware of it now, because you can see the, the, the vacuum out there. Republicans have just done... A, excuse me, a much better job over the last 20 years or so yeah. of uh, spotting uh, young talent, finding ways to use them and, and move them up uh, into uh, leadership positions. Uh, but um, uh, as far as uh, 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 rising stars in Illinois uh, right now, I have not seen them, but I, I like Lynn's uh, uh, picks there. They, uh, I just hope they... Um, don't, don't get squashed by the powers that be before they rise up and blossom. Well, it could be. And you know, another name uh, of people to watch is uh, Representative Robin Kelly, who took the second district seat after Jesse Jackson stepped down. But sometimes it takes time. Uh, I don't know what the future holds for Darren LaHood. He's, he's still in his uh, first term. Uh, he follows... When we talk about great Illinoisans, let me mention Ray LaHood. Forgive me for not bringing up his name until now, mm -hmm. uh, who I know Clarence knows yeah. well. Everybody and, knows Ray. <laughs> well, and he is, he is about as Illinois as it gets in Washington. Now, he is an example of a politician who, uh, like Durbin, you, you can, you're fluent in Illinois and you could talk national or globally, but you always have one, you always have one foot back mm -hmm. home. 
And you know, look at the Ray LaHood career. You know, top staffer for Bob Michael, takes his seat, rises and uh, rises in the House, retires, goes to be the Transportation Secretary under Barack Obama. Because when you talk about moderate Republicans, that's mm -hmm. the mold of Ray LaHood. He forged a relationship with Rahm Emanuel, Democrat, Republican. They got things done. I think they also liked each other. And that helps a lot in a political <laughs> climate. When, when you have differences and you don't like each other, which is kind of how we are now, it's a little harder. And uh, he became a, uh, a member of the Obama cabinet. And I think to this day he is one of the leaders in some of these, and he had when he was in office and out of office, uh, of the movements for civility and bipartisanship, okay. which for the moment I think has a way to go given the current <laughs> climate. Yeah, a, a, a real hood today on the scene would be excoriated as, as a rhino, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he was marvelous at it. And, and it wasn't uh, 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 what phony or contrived at all. It was just very naturally get along with everybody. And uh, he was, the kind, of, he was the, the kind of moderation I was referring to yeah. earlier when yeah. I said the, the, the Illinois Republicans just seem so much more sensible than mm -hmm. most of the rest of the states. So... Uh, Neither of the state's two senators came up. Well, I, I mentioned Durbin, but now you, and talking about Illinois history, we should discuss the historic election in 1992 in the last year of the woman of Carol Mosley Braun, who I first met when she was a state representative in Springfield, and you probably met her, what, that time too? I or remember before? when she was part of the Harold Washington ticket. Remember that? The, uh, the <laughs> dream she, team. Dream team ticket, yeah. yeah that was back in the 80s there. When she was yeah. running for recorder of deeds? I think that was it, yeah. That was yeah. it, yeah. So I These met her in Springfield. Jobs that don't then this is a Cook County all, recorder but, of yeah. deeds, and then she ran uh, after the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings. She decided to run, and it was historic. First female senator from Illinois and the first African-American female in the United States Senate. So and, the, and the first loss for Alan Dixon in his career. Huh. After, and, and when, but when you asked us about senators, so until then, I mean, Alan Dixon was another big figure back home mm -hmm. you know, who, who was able to juggle that local and national. And everyone knows, you know, all our viewers, if you don't know it, when you say Al, it's Al the Pal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Because he got along. And uh, he had a legacy of staffers that have worked on the Hill for years. Some of them might still be around. I mean, he had a, you know, he, and he ran, what, the Base Closure Commission? Mm -hmm. The Base Realignment Commission after th that. So uh, we have now, when we talk about up-and-comers, the reason I didn't mention freshman Senator Tammy Duckworth is that she's already up-and-come. Uh, you know, it's not a matter of waiting. Look at, yeah, I met her in 2000, I think five, Durbin invited soldiers who were from Illinois to be as guests, two of them, at the State of the Union. And she was wounded, recovering from her wounds at Walter Reed. Uh, Durbin did a little press availability. Beforehand, they were going to sit in this box. And I met her. And... I thought, oh my God, to even come outside with the kind of wound she had and was covering. And we talked about the war in Iraq, and she had views, and we talked about them. And even though she suffered terribly in that war, uh, she understood what war meant and why she did it. Even if I got the sense back in that day in 2005, she didn't necessarily agree with it. Uh, which, by the way, fast forward, I just did a story on how she wants. Trump to be made more aware and to talk more about the cost of war because she knows what it is. But anyway, so when we talk about people who, you know, she has a relatively quick rise in the scheme of things because after, what, two terms in the House? So, so she ran for the House in 06 and lost, went to run the Illinois State Department of Veteran Affairs, and President, then President Obama tapped her to be an executive in the VA. And then she ran uh, for the House and then the Senate. So that is a pretty fast rise. But could you see, I mean, do you think, so she's already rising. Yeah. But uh, do you see her as like a future player? Yes. As, Absolutely. As you guys? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because this is a, she is starting a career now that I think has uh, just no limit in a, in a sense, depending on what she wants to do. Potential leadership. If you're asking 
does she have potential leadership in her? Yeah, absolutely. And do you see um, Senator Durbin, who is a leader in the Senate for the Democrats, um, will he maintain that? Um, if you had to uh, predict his uh, future plans, what, <laughs> what's he planning to do? Well, a good question. I, I've um, uh, tr tried to get out of the prediction habit ever since uh, last November's election. Some of you may recall that. Uh, but um, I, I think the, the thing about Dick Durbin, I hope he doesn't fall into the kind of position that uh, Bob Michael uh, fell into because Michael, tr tr throughout his long career as a, as a Republican leader, it was never in the majority. Uh, and so it, it was good that he had the kind of personality that was a good deal maker and got along with folks because mm -hmm. he was able to get things done, yeah. uh, even with the party being uh, in, in, in the minority for a long time. Uh, and uh, uh, with, with Durbin, I uh, detect a similar kind of a thing because the Democrats don't have the clout. Yeah. <laughs> what clout uh, in uh, this town right now and uh, um, how much, but, but you know, things, things can change uh, depending on what the uh, next couple of elections uh, uh, do and uh, he'll be well positioned anyway, mm -hmm. um, and particularly on uh, uh, international affairs. He's really, mm -hmm. uh, really mm -hmm. excellent. But uh, I think I think he's been a good senator for Illinois. Yeah. Well, here, here's mm -hmm. what's interesting about Durbin. Uh, he isn't sometimes. He is uh, one of the few lawmakers who I have covered who could actually create an issue, who sees something out there and is able to articulate it and bring it forth. What do I mean? Dick Durbin understood and invented the dreamer movement. Mm. When he came yeah. across a young lady in Illinois who we didn't have the term dreamer, he invented it. He was part of the, in his air. And he saw, oh my God, we have, he learned the story. This one young lady realized there are so many people around Illinois alone who have been brought here illegally through no fault of their own. And now we got to, you know, what is their situation? What is to be done? Because it is, no matter where you stand on the issue, it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, Dick Durbin, when he was in the House, uh, started the crusade that led to the banning of smoking on airlines. He identified that as an issue. Uh, Dick Durbin was one of the leaders in food safety. The first time I heard of Elizabeth Warren is when Dick Durbin mentioned her. She was a Harvard Law professor and wrote some monograph or paper on the need for some kind of consumer finance commission. It was Dick Durbin who turned that, that monograph into a bill right. calling for the creation of what is now in the news today, the Consumer Finance Board. Okay, it's Dick Durbin that took on the whole issue of student loan uh, debt and predatory practices. So out of all the people I cover, I try sometimes to say, what is this person identified with? And it is for some people hard. You know, everybody says, well, I want uh, tax equity, fine, or, or I want to have more business, or those are generalities. But when you think of causes, this is where Durbin is unique among almost everyone I have covered, hmm. is that he's had that ability uh, to do that. True. Well, I have to say, again, as a Wisconsin native, I have a serious inferiority complex now <laughs> because uh, listening to these stories, um, it certainly is fun to think about all the things that Illinois lawmakers have done for the state or the country. And we could not have had better tour guides to take us on that trip down memory lane and a little into the future. So thank both of you. Well, thank you. Thank you. So Next, from Chicago, we attend a panel discussion at the annual conference of the Illinois Association of School Boards titled Legislative Issues Impacting Schools. Speakers include Republican State Representatives Bob Pritchard and Thomas Bennett, Democrat State Senator Scott Bennett, and Tony Smith, the State Superintendent of Education. This runs about one hour. Uh, we have a great panel today. And uh, it's been a very, very eventful year, obviously. Lots of things that have happened over the last year or so. And lots of anticipation on what might happen in the next session as we come back into play in January. And of course, the big picture, picture of things that took place this last year in regard to budget, 
in regard to school funding are kind of at the top of the list. Uh, and so our legislators will talk a little bit about, and we give each of them uh, an opportunity to have a little bit of a retrospective on what the year was for them, uh, then a little bit of uh, what the future might be. And then we have uh, the superintendent, uh, state superintendent uh, Tony Smith with us also, who will talk a little bit about what now has on his plate based upon what <laughs> has happened in the legislative session and some of the other kinds of things that the State Board of Education is working on to uh, move things forward, both federal as well as state-related legislative and legal issues. So our panel today, uh, Representative Tom Bennett is on my right over here. Tom is from uh, the Gibson City area, 106th District. Uh, Tom is a Republican in the House. Uh, Bob Pritchard, to my right also, another Republican House member. And Bob uh, represents the DeKalb Sycamore area, uh, the 70th District. On my left, we have Scott Bennett, and Scott is uh, in the Champaign area, 52nd District, and uh, just by the way, Scott is Tom's nephew, so we got a little bit of Republican <laughs> Democrat going on in this, uh, in this family, uh, House and Senate, so... Uh, Wait for Thanksgiving. That's right. Good thing they're and then, of course, uh, uh, Tony Smith with us from the State Board of Education. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Bob Pritchard, just a little bit of background on that. You know, Bob co-sponsored uh, the evidence-based funding model and was a very, very you know, ardent leader through that over the last several years, very committed to that process, uh, worked, worked through many of the issues related to you know, caucus and everything else, remained a sponsor all the way through. And uh, the sad part is that Bob has already declared that he's retiring uh, and won't run again for his next uh, seat. So we're going to really miss him. He's been a real stalwart for education issues within the House and on a statewide basis. So I'm going to let, let Bob take the first uh, stab here at talking a little bit about what happened this year and things he's looking forward to in the spring. Good morning. Morning. Let me begin by thanking all of you for being a part of the educational system in the state of Illinois. You all have different roles, but they're all important roles. And my philosophy, long before I became a legislator, was that education is one of the most important services that the state can provide its residents. Because it's through the training, through the skill development, that people are able to change their lives, able to achieve their dreams. So you really are at the starting gate for our young people as they look to gain those skills and build visions for their future and then work towards achieving those futures. Actually, I have been in the legislature for 15 years, but my involvement and interest in education funding far precedes me. <coughs> Going back into the 1970s before some of you were born, I was involved with the Farm Bureau in trying to change how education is funded. Fast forward, what, 40 years or better? We finally have done that. This is something that has been talked about for decades and generations. In fact, you probably can even go back to the early years of our statehood. And we always had questions about how we were going to fund education fairly and equally dealing with the great diversity that we have in our state and how we can give every kid the kind of wraparound services that will help them uh, achieve what they want to achieve. And as I look at this last legislative session, of course, that is my number one uh, feeling of success is that we were able to work through and develop through a lot of people's involvement and the School Management Alliance and Mike Jacoby in particular were very instrumental in helping bring all of that together. But it was a coalition of education groups that really helped bring this bill to fruition. And we have to go back to probably 2013, when the Senate had some study commissions and started to look at an evidence-based model. And then a lot of the support groups started lobbying legislators. And it was a multi-year process to really get people to understand, to fine-tune the evidence-based model. But I think we have resulted or, or, or concluded with a very good model. The question and the challenge for all of us is will we continue to fund it? 
will we add the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars every year that's going to be necessary to get to that adequacy level that all of you are trying to strive for. So the evidence-based model was one of the biggest pieces of legislation that I think we passed out of the 584 some bills that we did pass this year. But getting a budget was also a significant issue. And after going two years without a budget, after building billions of dollars of unpaid bills and the impact that has on your districts as well as all suppliers for the state services, it was something that couldn't continue. And then we looked at rolling back income taxes, now increasing income taxes, and all the discussions and arguments that we had over that. And then finally, adopting an ESSA plan, an Every Student Succeeds plan. And I'm assuming Tony's going to go into a little bit more about that. Because that is one of the big impacts that the legislation we've done this year has upon you and your districts. But going back a little bit to the evidence-based model, there are a lot of benefits in that for school districts, but there's also a lot of responsibilities. And I hope you as school leaders, as school board members, realize the opportunities that you have before you. As a legislator for only 15 years, every year we talked about school unfunded mandates and how the legislature kept adding unfunded mandates. Well, for the first time, we've given you a wider window of trying to get around some of those mandates and apply what applies to your district but not apply what doesn't apply to your district. And we have a streamlined waiver process that you can now go through. We've had a reduction in the requirements for physical education every day that gives you some options if it fits your district. And we've allowed you to outsource driver's ed without the red, red tape that we've acquired before. We tried to get a few other mandates relief, and we're unsuccessful, but there's always next year. And that's a good slogan for this city. <laughs> so as you look at the opportunities you have, we are now looking at not only the uh, school funding reform recommendation of some $9,000 for every student around the state, to looking at the needs of your students and looking at a formula for funding the services that would meet those needs and helping you achieve an adequate level of funding for your district. That's a huge accomplishment, but it's a huge responsibility because we've identified 27 elements based on research that improve student outcomes, but we give you the freedom of whether you're going to implement those 27 elements with the funding that we do provide albeit a decade or 15 years before we provide all of it, Tony. But at least we've been on a track to providing more money every year. This year, $350 million, and hopefully successive years, so that you can get the funding necessary to provide the services that are necessary for the students that you have. And when we do that, we can start addressing the issues that you heard about in the earlier presentation this morning about the poverty that we have in our districts and the growing needs of those students, but also the growing needs of English language learners and minority students. They all have different needs and they need different wraparound services that we've not been able to provide in most cases. Now we're gonna to try to get the funding and we have the best practices identified. So it's up to your boards and your leadership to decide which ones apply to your district and how you can wrap them around the students that you have. It's a huge responsibility. And before we've always said, well, we don't have the funding to do this or that the student needs. But hopefully over the next few years, we'll give you that funding and you'll be able to provide those services. Which then comes into the issue of accountability or accomplishment or student growth. That's where the new federal law, the Every Student Succeed Act comes into play and the wonderful plan that our State Board of Education, through a lot of collaboration with maybe many of you, has put together on how we want to accomplish that, and how we're going to measure student growth, and how we're going to put some pressure behind using the funding for those best practices that will help the student. And of course, you can't do any of this without revenue. 
And that was one of the big debates that we had in the legislature this year was we rolled back the income tax from 5 to 3.75, and now we've raised it back to 4.95 for the average citizens. And people are declaring that that's going to force more citizens out of our state and force us uh, to really miss the mark of providing the services that the state needs. And I contend it all depends upon the mindset and how we sell the issue. Because when you have services that citizens want and elect legislators to provide, you have to fund them. That's one of my fundamental principles. I'm sure it's one of yours. It's the responsibility that we're supposed to have balanced budgets. And when we don't have the revenue for the expenses that we want to incur, there's only one other alternative, and that you look for the revenue. And a lot of people say, well, cut revenue more. Well, look at the revenue bill that we passed. There were $3 billion of cuts in that revenue bill. And if you look at pension reform that everyone is concerned about, what, $140 billion of unpaid revenue uh, or unpaid pension obligation, we had some reforms in, in creating the opportunity for a Tier 3 and looking at a high, hybrid system of defined benefit and defined contribution. That's going to move us a little bit. And then when you look at the other issues that we've tried to provide in here of, of looking at tax relief, that's part of the evidence-based model. That if you're in a high tax, low wealth district, you have the opportunity for a tax swap. And there are 40 districts, I believe, that qualify for that this next year. And if you're a high wealth district, your citizens have the opportunity for a referendum. Now I know many of you probably won't have to face that issue. But if you do, simply sell what you're doing for the kinds of students you have. Because citizens generally want the best for their kids and their grandkids and, and the future people that provide services in your community. And that allows for a 110% of adequacy, which doesn't affect many of you, but if it does, your citizens can go through a referendum process to try to lower taxes by that 10% level. So there's something in there for a lot of people, and that's really how we were able to get some of this legislated through, was to have compromise, where people did what legislators have always done, and that's to look at their core values and then try to uh, compromise around the edges of those core values. That's something that we seem to lack to, in, in Washington right now, and in often cases we lack it here in Springfield. But that was something that came together in this piece of legislation. And I think that gives us hope for the future, that if we can look at that accomplishment, if people are, are visiting with their legislators and letting them know what they think and what the impacts of some of these requirements are, I think it's going to get us to a better point. And then finally, as, as we look at the responsibilities going forward, there are responsibilities dealing with looking at your students and how you provide services for your students, but also looking at the tax relief issue and looking at other options that we've given you in this bill. I think it gives you some flexibility, and with that comes responsibility to try to move forward with a better education model than what the state has structured for you this year. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Representative Pritchard. I'm going to go next to Representative uh, Tom Bennett. Um, Tom is a former high school science teacher, so he's been in education, kind of understands some of the issues from the teacher side. Uh, Tom also served on the, uh, the House Appropriations Committee that took a look, a lot of look at what was Senate Bill 1 or the evidence-based model initially, and then, of course, 1947. <coughs> I remember, I'll never forget on May 30th, when we were trying to get that through the, the House, the caucuses met, and the first person I saw out of, coming out of caucus uh, was Tom, and he came up to me, I, I could see it on his face, that there was going to be some difficulty here getting the Republican caucus to support that in the House. The good news is we did get him to support us in 1947 at the end, and that's really what we needed to get uh, the evidence-based model in place. So let's welcome a Representative Tom Bennett. Thank you. Uh, we're very glad to be with you. 
Bob, I gotta tell you, he's a wealth of information. Just listening to him talk about all these things and all the issues that have been going on and the way he captured them and put them together. I wish I had a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Tremendous. Uh, and Mike, I want to thank you for all your efforts too with, with the efforts on the evidence base. I know you and Ralph uh, just worked a lot of time to, to try and make that happen. Glad to be with you. Yes, my name is Tom Bennett. Uh, that's Tom. Uh, there's another Bennett here, and we'll, we'll get to him in just a, a little bit here. Uh, I've been your state representative in 106 for three years. Uh, I'm the second term of our general uh, assembly as your state representative. Before I go, I go very far, I need to do something. I can recognize, if I may, an outstanding educator in my district. Her name is Lindsay Jensen. White, where are you guys at? Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, there there should have been a right hoo-hoo right there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we need to do this. Um, we need to recognize a, a wonderful teacher. Her name is Lindsay Johnson of Dwight Township High School. An excellent English teacher. And she was recently recognized as, as the 2018 Illinois Teacher of the Year by the Illinois State Board of Education. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> Superintendent uh, Dr. Richard Jancic, uh, Brian Krishnik uh, is our board president, and Brian's here in the in the second row with with the whole group here all together. So it's, it's just tremendous, and congratulations to the, the entire school district. I met her the other day, and that she is just so full of energy, and and you can just see how she just captures the kids. I keep thinking, this is English. <laughs> you know, no, English is great. I just wasn't very good at that in high school, and so for someone to capture that. And capture at the high school level, I mean, that is tremendous. Because that, and that's what we need that. So fantastic. So congratulations to her uh, and the entire school district. As uh, Mike was saying, my background, and uh, basically I was a uh, high school science teacher in Melvin Sibley. Anybody heard of Melvin Sibley? Yeah. Oh, hey. 75 kids in high school and 77 kids in the junior high. Uh, a long time ago. Uh, my wife is a retired school teacher. She taught business for almost 33 years at the same place. My mom taught in a one-room country schoolhouse a long time ago. Uh, she went to Illinois State when I was a two-year college. That kind of gives you an idea. But things have changed, of course, and in a lot of ways, a whole lot better for, the, for where we are today in, in the future. And just like many of you, I have served on a school board both uh, the Gibson City and the GCMS school boards. And at one point I was the vice chair of the Corn Belt Division. So I want to thank you for your service. I understand we talk about phone calls late at night. I understand we talk about uh, uh, issues on the, on the school board that may involve uh, coaches, curriculum, colors, uniforms. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm understanding those things. Some of the challenges that you go through, <laughs> So thank you for being there. Thank you for stepping up to helping your communities. That is so critical to do. Today is not an easy time for school boards or school administrators. You've had to deal with Springfield and, and the public on a number of issues around getting payments from Springfield for transportation, special ed, evidence-based school funding that uh, Bob talked about a little bit, transgender issues, uh, Every Student Success Act, the ESS, park testing, I've heard from a number of you on a period of, uh, of time over that. Uh, Common Core, and then also how do we find new teachers? How do we bring new teachers on board to get them uh, with us in Illinois? Reports of high salaries and pensions and other topics as, as well. At times, I think, of course, Springfield uh, added to our fund, unfunded band-aids. I think at one time, there was a list of about 200. Okay, it still is. <laughs> uh, unfunded band-aids and I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that's not the plan, but that's what happens sometimes. Um, when we get a chance for microphones, I do have a question for the for the audience. One of those unfunded mandates that we just had this time was curse of writing. That was passed through. I see some heads nodding on this. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that as well. I've been asked, uh, Tom, since you've been there in Springfield for three years, what have you learned? So let me share a short story. The story begins like this. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> the crew member says, Captain, Captain, wake up. Captain says, well, 
crew member says, sorry to wake you, sir, but we have a serious problem. The captain says, well, what is it? The crew member says, there's a ship in our sea lane about 20 miles away, and they refuse to move. The captain says, well, what do you mean they refuse to move? Just tell them to move. The crew member says, sir, we've told them, and they just will not. The captain says, I'll tell them. The signal goes out, move starboard 20 degrees. Signal returns. Move starboard yourself. 20 degrees. Captain says, I can't believe this. I mean, I'm a captain. Let them know who I am. I'm important. Signal goes out. This is Captain Horatio Hornblower, the fifth, commanding you to move starboard 20 degrees at once. Signal returns. This is Seaman Carl Jones, the second, commanding you to move starboard 20 degrees at once. Captain says, what arrogance. I mean, what presumption. Here's a seaman commanding me a captain. We could just blow them out of the water. Let them know who we are. Signal is this. This is the mighty Missouri, flagship of the 7th Fleet. Signal returns. This is the lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> I first heard of the story from a guy named Stephen Covey, who's a tremendous motivational speaker, and he believes this to be true. But there's two things I've taken away from the story. The first one is this. The person with the biggest guns does not always win. Second thing, the person with the loudest voice and maybe the longest pedigree does not always win. The third thing I take away from this is the person that stands firm in what he believes in and what he knows to be true can win. What do you think? Agree? I think to be, to be successful in life, you have to understand people and work together to get things done. It has to do with trust. And we've struggled with that in Springfield for the last three years. So today, where are we at? Well, we have a balance to all of back up. We have a budget that we tried to balance. Didn't work out quite so well. It took three years <coughs> to get a budget, though. We have a tax increase. and still looking for some reforms. We bring in about $36 billion for our general revenue fund. We're the fifth largest economy in the country, which just that alone makes us one of the largest economies in the world. We passed the evidence-based education bill, and I, I know we're all very hopeful for that. A lot of good things we, we believe will come from that. We also know that students are going to go to other universities right now in other states. We've seen it. And parents, we know that if our children leave the state, what happens? They may not be back, right? <coughs> I saw a study that looked at people leaving the state, and those that are coming into the state have an average salary of $20,000 less than those that are leaving. And with all of that, I hear a number of times that we're in need of a capital bill, an infrastructure bill, one that helps improve roads and bridges, all right? Illinois roads, uh, they could get better, couldn't they? And our biggest issue, I think, is the financial stability of our state. We're $9 billion in unpaid bills. Some people have not been paid for over a year or more. We owe more money on new bonds to pay down the debt. And our public pensions are the worst funded in the country. I think someone mentioned $140 billion, $130 billion. At some point, with all the zeros, I don't know. But it's a lot. It's a lot. Of course, and, and that's really only if everyone retired to do it. But either way, we spend over $7 billion for our pension payments. And the payments go up every year, and those payments will take a bigger bite out of the rest of the budget until we get this figured out. It's a big money away from schools, social services, and roads, and everything else. So what we're hearing about today, I think, uh, for just a moment, in Springfield, I want to talk about in terms of pensions. Uh, there's a lot of talk about what do we do with pensions? How do we fix that? I think in times in the past we talked about cost shifting. There's basically move some of that to local K-12 school districts. That's an issue. Solution? We've got a lot to think about. A lot, a lot to work through on that. But that is something out there. Um, there's also been talk about, well, what do we do about the pensions? Do we tax the pensions? That's some discussion. How do we pay for this? 
It's a mess. It's an absolute mess. We've read about some of those things. Um, there's some talk about changing the tax structure. But either way, as we work through these different issues and, and challenges, we've got to find a way to get this resolved sooner than later. This has gone far too long. And every day this goes on, the amount that we owe goes up farther and farther. So to get out of this financial pressure, we have a limited number of options, and none of them are easy. Illinois cannot go bankrupt. We cannot tax ourselves out of this. We can't cut our way out of this. And the only real way, I think, is to try and grow the economy. We've got to do a better job of helping people dream. That's kind of what Bob was talking about, about dreams. Help them figure out where they need to get to, and then help them get there. Personal accountability, helping business grow, creating jobs, all the things that we know that we need to do. I was at the high school in Watsiki, Illinois, just a few days ago, actually last Thursday. We talked about three state branches of government. It was the city's classes that we talked to. We talked about who was responsible for what. We talked about elected officials, what they did, and those sorts of things. And the kids really did pretty well. As class time was winding down, I asked them, what do you want to talk about? Several hands went up. They also were motivated by the Tootsie Rolls that I had in my package there to pass out. First thing that came up was term limits. Why don't we have those? Great conversation. Second thing they brought up, what about marijuana? <laughs> Medicinal marijuana is legal now. But what about the whole thing? Great conversations. These are our future leaders, and we need to be engaged with what they're talking about. Great conversation. Talk about balanced budget. What's a budget mean? Yeah, as long as you've got the credit card, <laughs> that can help us. But it's a lot of issues on those too. And then finally, one senior asked, what really happens in Springfield that we don't read about in books? I said, well, okay, i got two things you can try. If I may say, there's a guy by the name of Speaker Mannion who has more power than the governor when it comes to, to lawmaking. Some of the bill, bills that we vote on are not real. They're more about positioning. 4,000 bills, I think, went to the House this past year, and Speaker Madigan has control over every one of them. And that impacts my ability to represent my district. The Speaker has the ability to create the bill and shape the discussion around it. We vote on bills sometimes we know it will never become law. And just to give you an example, I voted on a bill, I think, 17, 18 times around property taxes. And we knew it was never going to go anywhere. But that took time, took positioning, and that's the politics side of this that's very real. So that was one thing we shared. And the second thing I said, much of what you see in the news today and in Springfield is and has been focused on the next governor election. Whoever is elected governor will have an impact on drawing the legislative maps and impact the gerrymandering of how these maps are drawn. And these maps already are key to the power and how it works in Springfield. Those maps are key to a, the power in which both the House works and the Senate works. And if the Democrats maintain control of the General Assembly and a Democrat wins the governor's seat, more than likely Speaker Madigan will again get to draw the maps the way he wants to, and I understand it. The other option, if the Democrats maintain control of the General Assembly and a Republican wins the governor's seat, then there may be some kind of map compromise or a map on the other side. That's the way we have it in our Constitution today. So at least twice in the last two major elections, I guess you could say, people tried to put the gerrymandering question on the ballot, but both times it was shut down. The people really were not hurt on what's going to be said. So either way, uh, we're going from here. We try to talk about a lot of different issues very quickly, but again, it's truly an exciting time to be in Springfield. Frustrating at the same time, <laughs> but we've got more to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Uh, we're going to go now to the Senate side of the, uh, the legislature. And Scott Bennett. Scott uh, served a little bit as a assistant state's attorney, so he's got a good legal mind, which is uh, always very helpful within the, you know, within the legislature. Um, uh, supported the budget, supported uh, you know, Senate Bill 1, 
passed on Senate Bill in 1947, and that'll be something I'm sure he'll talk about in terms of some of the reasons why it was difficult and the compromise to support that. So let's welcome uh, Scott. Good morning. Uh, as I stated, my name is Scott Bennett. I'm the only Democrat legislator on the panel. I'm um, the only senator, only one without tight comments, so I'll be brief. Uh, only one not wearing a tie, so that's how you know <laughs> it'll be fast. Um, first of all, I just wanted to echo some of the comments earlier, uh, how much we appreciate being here today uh, and the chance to come and talk to you. Probably, we have very tough jobs, there's no question, but people in this room, I think, have tougher ones. Uh, while we certainly get no shortage of people coming up to us and telling us they could do our job better, some of them are maybe right, actually. It's not election year, so I can tell you that. Um, but you guys, since everyone, or most everyone, has gone through a school system, I went to high school. I think I could tell you, superintendent <laughs> or school board, exactly what you're doing wrong uh, until the point when you ask them, would you like to get on the school board and, and try to work on that? Well, well I'm pretty busy. Uh, but uh, I think you guys, because people have a little bit of uh, knowledge, sometimes that can be a dangerous thing, and I know you certainly get uh, the lion's share of criticism in your own community. So thank you for what you do. You get uh, very, very little praise uh, and, and often a lot of criticism, um, but I can't imagine where we'd be without you guys stepping up to the plate and being leaders of the Um My uncle mentioned uh, quite a few things, uh, some of which we'll address tomorrow at Thanksgiving. We won't fight in front of others. I feel sorry for the rest of the people there uh, as we talk about gerrymandered districts and things like that. <laughs> but uh, he mentioned someone that's really important to me and was certainly important to, to him. That would be his mother, my grandmother, Sherilyn Bennett. Uh, as he mentioned, it really wasn't that long ago um, that she was the product of a one-room schoolhouse. In fact, all four of my grandparents, growing up in rural southern Illinois, went to rural one-room schoolhouses. Um, the school uh, that Grandma went to was called Pleasant Valley Country School, which sounds like a country club now, but no, it, it was certainly not uh, at that time. Um, and while it sounds really nice, you've got to imagine you had everyone, probably 10 or 12 kids, from a two-mile area, which, which is as far as, at that time, the state of Illinois thought you could walk in the snowy conditions. Uh, and you had first through eighth grade all in one room. So you had, you were hoping you had a smart kid a year ahead of you because you were going to get a lot more time getting taught by you're a second grader or the third grader than you are from the teacher who's trying to teach eight grades at one time. Uh, you can't imagine the despair that they had. And then for my grandmother, she then, when she gets to high school, then she goes into town and has to compete against kids who went into a more traditional elementary school setting. And then you go into the world and you have to compete against kids from the city who had, you know, very different upbringing. So the disparity you had in one state, depending on if you had a smart kid a year ahead of you or a good country school teacher, uh, or you lived in the city, that was something obviously the state said we can't tolerate. We're one state. We can't have those kind of differences. So it was actually in the early 50s, late 40s, uh, that they changed that. And they brought all the country kids into town. And that was a monumental, state-changing um, innovation that completely changed the face of education. So for about the last half of the century, you had kind of that stagnant system that most of us went through. Um, and we're getting used to that. But then we realize, even in that system, huge disparities were growing, right? If you, in my, my district in particular, um, it's, it's helpful even in a small section of East Central Illinois, you see that disparity. You have Champaign-Urbana, which has a lot of very educated people being a college town, a lot of new money coming in when professors will move in or industries will spring up in the research parks there. But I also have towns like Danville, which suffer through some of the de-industrialization that you've seen across the Midwest. Um, and some real money issues they have there. And a whole lot of small rural communities in which um, they have a really hard time meeting the bare minimum of what they'd like to do. So even in that area, in a 20 or 30 mile area, you have just huge swings of wealth. Um, and that was met also by state funding disparities where you have some in wealthy school districts getting two, three, three and a half times the state funding you get in a rural school, only compounding that problem. It's bad enough and then it gets worse. So I really applaud Representative Pritchard and, and my seatmate in the Senate, Andy Menard, and the work they've done for years to try to change this, to move this aircraft carrier in a different direction, um, which isn't easy to do. Because anytime you have some schools that are at the top of that and some schools at the bottom, and you say, well, let's bring those bottom schools up, that sounds great. What's the other side of that? You have to possibly bring some of those schools down, or at least let other schools catch up to you, because nobody's excited to lose their advantage, right? And for those of you that are school members of those areas, 
your job is to protect those kids, not, not necessarily to think about the whole state. So that's not an easy thing. And they've struggled with this and found new formulas and really wrestled with that. But I would argue <laughs> that what they're trying to do is every bit as transformational as what we saw in the 1950s when you brought those country kids to town. You're trying to remember we are one state and how you somehow can find one formula that'll work for rural kids, small town kids, and the city of Chicago kids. That's not easy. And that's the job we face now in the legislature. I would say uh, that we have, I, I think, three major issues which we're going to see this year. As was stated, I was a big supporter of Senate Bill 1 uh, through most of its negotiation. Like all things, uh, sometimes negotiation isn't pretty. You've got to figure out how to get the votes. For me, the last compromise in which you brought enough votes over, including the governor's most important uh, vote so he could sign the bill, uh, was one where you basically created a tax shelter may be too strong a term, but a way to allow people who put in money into private school foundations to get a massive tax break. And for me, that was a bridge too far. Uh, and so that's something I think it's a, it was a one-year grant uh, one year pilot, the idea is, well, let's just see how this works. Um, to me, that's a slippery slope, and it's something that you as school board members and you as voters in the state of Illinois are going to have to really deal with. Where, when we recognize there's not enough public dollars to go around, to what extent are we comfortable with some of any of those public dollars being diverted off to go to private school funds? And that's something we should have a real discussion about as we go forward, not just this year, but in all years to come. The property tax freeze, in which Representative Bennett talked about how many times he's voted on it. That's not dead. That's, that's certainly an issue that continues to swirl, um, and understandably so. We, all across the state, in some, state, some parts of states more than others, we pay astronomically high property taxes, particularly compared to our neighbors in our neighboring states. And we have to talk about the reasons why and what ways we can lower those. So now the struggle begins. In fact, much of the debate of this year's budget was, all right, we maybe can get on board the property tax freeze, but at what extent? Can we do it for two years and study what effects that has? Or, as the governor said, should we do a permanent property tax freeze? And there's a lot of issues that are going to come around with that. And again, I welcome your comments because you are not only taxpayers, who probably many of you who own property yourselves and pay property taxes, but you also see what property taxes pay for in your local school districts. I would point out, in Springfield, we were very quick to tell to say, especially in election years, we're gonna, we want to put out those flyers to say we froze your property taxes, we lowered your property taxes. But Springfield neither raises or spends a dollar of your property taxes. Those are all spent in your local communities. And so that discussion should come. Who makes the decision about what the right property tax is? Is it in Springfield where you have, if you're lucky, one or two people from your community voting on it? Or there in your local district where everyone lives there, knows what the schools and parks and cities are like, and they can make that decision. Um, as elected on a local level. That's a discussion we should continue to have. And then finally, teacher shortages. My, the, the, I, I represent Champaign-Urbana, and is where I live now, but I represent a lot of rural communities, and I grew up in the town that Representative Bennett continues to live in, in Gibson City, where our family continues to farm for about 150 years. It's still the largest industry in the state, but we've seen over and over, no one, very few people, less than a dozen some years in this whole state of Illinois, are going into ag education. So we, this year, started a task force uh, with the State Board of Education, thank you to the Smith on this, um, to try to work on why is that? Why, what can we do, what incentives can we do, what can we do to make sure that we protect the largest industry in the state? And we've had two meetings thus far in the task force, and what I've been interested to find is, yes, there's absolutely a shortage in ag teachers, but that's, see ya. <laughs> but that is not limited to the agricultural fields. Teachers that are leaving the, 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 the field of education and going elsewhere, it's staggering. <clears throat> and we have to figure out why that is, and that's, that needs to be a long conversation. When people say, well, why is that? There's not a silver bullet that answers all those questions. But it is something we have to begin the conversation before it's too late. For the administrators of the room, many I'm sure will be able to tell you a story. A, a decade ago when there was an opening, they got a dozen, two, three dozen applicants, depending where you live. Now they get two or three, if they get that. Why is that? And what can we do to reverse that trend going forward? So those are some of the issues I want to talk about. Um, I want to give more time for some questions because I'm sure you guys have some other things we need to be thinking about. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Senator Bennett.
Uh, the next uh, individual needs no real introduction because we've known Tony now for quite a while. I will say that uh, I do remember a P20 meeting, uh, but maybe two years ago, when you said, if we can't get school funding done, then we should just basically give up and go home. Because <laughs> we were all in favor of it. Everybody was there. Senator Menard, Senator, I think Bob might have even been there. Um, Berkman. Everybody, Berkman, everybody was there. We wanted to get it done. Well, you know what it took to get that done? It took a lot of co cooperation with the State Board of Education. Uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of hours before even the first heavy space bill hit the, hit the pavement. And thanks to Tony and his team for being willing to work on those things. Um, and it took some criticism over that because working behind the scenes on something is not an easy thing for an agency to do uh, because you <coughs> tend to be showing a bit of a commitment to that and then have to kind of close the door on that for every single other issue that comes to the, to the table. And I know there were, there were times there were 10 or 11 different requests for new modeling done on the evidence-based model. And of course, everybody wants to have right. this model and I want the results <laughs> tomorrow. And uh, so his group did a really good district. job managing all of that. But running the state board is a, is a big issue. And remember, those of you who are here, he has his own board of uh, you know, directors, board, board of education that he has to answer to as well. Uh, but let's welcome him and he can talk about the future here in, in Illinois. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, and I see at least one of my board members, Ruth Cross. Yeah, anybody else? So Ruth Cross. <laughs> and I do start with deep appreciation, kind of echoing what's been shared um, by members of the General Assembly. The deep commitment locally to lead and volunteer and create the conditions for children to thrive and for families to be connected. I mean, educators are creating community. I think most of you know at this point, but I, I deeply believe healthy public schools are the heart of healthy community. If we don't create healthy public schools, we all suffer. Uh, the ability to create the conditions for our children to be contributing citizens. Uh, the primary workforce development agency in any community is the K-12 system. And our ability to think different about what our children need, and they are situated in very different places. So, I'll talk a little bit about, I mean, some extraordinary success, right? We have changed capital P policy in Illinois in some very fundamental ways. I mean, some potentially transformative ways. Uh, so evidence-based funding, this idea, and one of the reasons why I said what I said at that meeting was people were saying, hey, this isn't fair. There, kind of, there came to be a moment where across the aisle, across the entire general, yeah, this really isn't fair. There are some issues here. We gotta do something different. So that was a real step forward. Obviously, working out all the how you address that is, is a big deal. But now, those kids that are furthest away from adequacy in communities that have the least resources are now prioritized with new funding. That's a very big deal, right? So, you know, if you've spent time in classrooms or in schools doing professional development, there's kind of the warm, cool, and hard feedback, like how you do feedback to each other. So that's really good, the warm feedback. Uh, there are a couple of major problems. The, the, the core is still on local property tax. So, so the fundamental problem was not addressed in the bill. Right? So I mean, if you're in your local community, you get this. Because we still have the situation where now we're talking about you know, percent reliance on state funding and percent of adequacy. So now we've started to do those numbers. And you know, some folks have talked about this. We have districts right now today at 46% of adequacy, and districts well over 200% of adequacy in Illinois right now today. Okay, so that fundamental structural inequity is not fixed by evidence-based funding. Um, obviously, as an advocate for districts and for families and for kids in those districts, uh, you know, state board is going to be saying, "Hey, full funding," because anything less is disabling the future of Illinois. 60%, like there's an expectation in the state that by 2025, 60% of our kids will have a high quality post-secondary credential or degree. Because over 70% of the jobs will require that. Uh, if we want people employed, they need to keep learning, right? So how well are we preparing our kids to keep doing that? Uh, there are deep, deep issues, right? We have 
almost over two million kids in Illinois, over half of those children are living in poverty, and over half of those children are students of color. So we have more students of color than we have white students, and we have more students living in poverty than we have students who are not. So if we keep talking about it just universal in general, we will not interrupt the deep inequity in this state. So evidence-based funding does something pretty radical. It changes the conversation, but we haven't done enough yet by far. The other thing, right, House Bill 656. So the folks in this room who hammered on that, advocated for it, you're champions. <laughs> Illinois was the only state in the country that for title funding, the pension that everybody talks about. So if you're a superintendent or board, you know this story almost 40 cents on the dollar was going to pensions for title funding. Now, title funds, for everybody in this room, you know this already, goes to your highest need kids. <laughs> well, if you're taking 40 cents of the dollar, you start buying stuff instead of people. And we know the biggest difference maker for kids with high needs is people, not stuff. So House Bill 656 is extraordinary. It now brings it down to normal costs from the title funding that's $72 million more for our kids. That's a massive win. So there are some things that are extraordinary. I mean, capital P policy changes that are great for our kids. Uh, Every Student Succeeds Act creating the conditions in this state to actually have growth as a primary infrastructure now for our accountability system. Moving from just attainment, which was did you or didn't you, and if you didn't, with zero recognition of your local conditions and where your kids were situated. So now we've moved to growth. Uh, I appreciate everybody's effort to do that. Like, <coughs> we got that in, <coughs> excuse me, last April because we wanted to have lead time. Like, there are states right now that have submitted that have no idea what their accountability system is going to be next August. So the whole thing is official next August. We got ours done. We got it in. It took the full 120 days. <laughs> On the 120th day, I got a call from the secretary. Uh, yeah, you guys are approved. So now we've been <clears throat> setting out to figure out how will this actually work. You know, three of the indicators are still, we'll have those determined by uh, December. The growth, the infrastructure, the actual modeling, the regression analysis, all that, by March. So we'll actually have a, a durable framework that we can have a conversation about and, and how to really work together. Uh, you know, I think most of you know this, if you had a chance to hear me talk before or have been in your districts or your schools, deep respect and appreciation for what is happening in schools to create conditions for kids. They come from all over the place. I believe deeply that talent is abundant in the state and distributed across the state, across groups of kids. Opportunity is not, though. And how we have funded and the structural issues, like families don't get to pick all the, you know, the supports that they have or don't until they get to the school. And then the school is sit you know, situated somewhere and in a state that has not been providing funding. From 2009 to 17, public schools were underfunded by $4 billion. That money's not getting made up. Evidence-based funding isn't now suddenly saying, hey, we're going to make up for how we didn't pay for that. <clears throat> the deep inequity in this state, <clears throat> you guys are on the front lines of that every day, making a difference for kids and families. And we're trying to figure out a state agency you know, we've got under 400 folks, 852 districts. How and in what ways can we be facilitators of your success? Try to figure out how to respond and be much more engaged, service oriented. We've got a heck of a lot of work to do. And obviously it's not where it needs to be. Um, but I, you know, I'm pretty passionate about how and in what ways we can move the conversation in this state to what districts do well. Because part, part of teachers leaving this is an assault on the profession. Everybody says, oh, the public school system. You do too much. You don't do enough. You guys made a terrible decision. They don't make any decisions. It's never, what have they done well? How have they created the conditions for more kids to be OK? And what else do we have to do? Like, if you go into a classroom, remember back, did your teacher always tell you every day how terrible you were, what you didn't know? There was no hope for your future? No. As educators, we get to lead this conversation now. <clears throat> I think it's our time to lead. I think we've got to be more aggressive, more clear, 
and have a much finer point on the issues of inequity and what we're doing every day and champion that. Last thing I'll say, we had our third budget hearing yesterday. The stories that educators are bringing, and it's kind of how I, I learned my lesson my first year going to the General Assembly. Uh, basically, I got hammered. Why does ISBE need all this money? <laughs> I basically learned, hey, we need stories from the field. My second year, I went and said, well, Representative, this is from your community. I just heard from FFA. I just heard about this. That's why we're advocating for the ag line. Yeah, another senator says, hey, how much money can the state board cut? How much money can we cut from education? And I keep saying, you know, Senator, Chairman, Reverend Meeks said, go ask for all the money our kids need. I'm not here to offer you cuts. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to continue to champion, lead for, and demand the kind of support our kids need that you need to serve them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Okay, we're going to take a few questions here. And uh, so if you're thinking that you'd like to ask a question of one of our panelists, you can come up to the microphone in the aisle. We have a couple rules on that. One, we want to keep it civil. Uh, <laughs> oh. Two, um, the whole room leaves. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> two we, uh, we don't want to ask the same questions over and over, or, and also we don't want to have <laughs> just uh, opportunities for people to, you know, so, to pontificate, if you will. So let's keep them uh, kind of short and let's ask the question once, get some answers, and let's move on. So if you could just identify yourself, your community, uh, who you'd like to answer the question, and then ask your question, we'll get on. Joe Sonnefeld, um, Mount Prospect District 57. Two issues relating to property taxes and whoever wants to address them, uh, that would be fine. One is what's being talked about in Springfield to rein in the out of control TIF process. In Cook County, we have over 400 TIF districts and every property owner in, in Cook County is subsidizing every one of those TIFs. And there's been estimates that it's um, increased property tax bills maybe as much as 10%. So, uh, and of course, you know, the taxpayers come to our board meetings yelling and screaming about their property taxes. So that's one. Number two, is there any discussion at all going on about how we could possibly uh, treat commercial real estate tax differently from residential real estate tax? In my community, we have two neighboring districts both in Mount Prospect. One has a huge shopping center, a huge business center, and those lie just outside of the borders of my district. So while my district is spending $10,000 <clears> per student, my neighboring district in Mount Prospect spends $15,000 per student. That's an inequity not between downstate and the suburbs, not between Chicago and the suburbs. That's an inequity right in my community. And we have to do something um, to more widely distribute commercial property taxes. And I would suggest that um, a formula that compelled neighboring districts to set to share that revenue might also serve as an incentive for districts to consolidate. So I would like to hear uh, your comments on that. And, and if there is conversation, what's what's being uh, talked about in Springfield at this point? I'm going to go to you on the uh, Yeah, I'll answer the first part of that. That did come up, the, the disparity of, of what uh, school districts can have access to in a TIF district came up, and we decided with all the issues we were dealing with, we couldn't really deal with that one adequately. So we have formed a TIF task force to look between now and April at the whole issue of impact, consequences, impact on school districts, and what some alternatives would be. So keep monitoring that, give input to that task force, and hopefully we'll come up with some issue, because I know it's a big issue, especially where we have in some parts of the state residential TIF districts, which really is an impact on the school district, that you have to supply the services without any revenue. So it's a big issue. And when we look at, at the uh, property tax, sales tax issue, that one also has been talked about for a long time. And other states have better models where the state collects the sales tax and redistributes it. So there's no attraction for trying to get a business to come into your community versus your neighboring community 
for the sake of those sales taxes. But changing that in the short term is going to be a real difficult issue because there's a lot of people that support the system that we have right now. Anybody else want to comment on uh... well, I appreciate the question, Joe. This is my third year in the Senate, and I guess you could say my biggest criticism of the whole institution of the General Assembly and state government uh, is that it doesn't seem to have a plan. I hate, I hate to speak in successory posters, um, but you know there is the, the adage of failing to plan is planning to fail. When we're talking about, you know, this year we're two, well, the, in the last three years, we've won two years without uh, any funding for universities, and you heard about them about to close, and people said, well, maybe we have too many universities, or maybe we have too many community colleges. But there was no real effort to say, well, you want to sit down and talk about which ones you want to cut? You want to, you want to do this rationally, as you, I'm assuming people would expect us to do, and sit down and talk about these things? Or should we just kind of Darwinism and see who survives? Um, the same thing, you know, to Joe, to your questions, when we talk property taxes, um, some of the suggestions is, okay, if we do a property tax freeze, could we do it for a set amount of time and use that time, two, three years, whatever we find a consensus on, and actually use that time to study so it's data driven and not election campaign driven, right? Well, this way we can do it every two years and then I can put it on a flyer in perpetuity that I save your property taxes. I'm going to guess at some point my constituents are pretty smart. They're going to realize their property taxes aren't really going up. They're stopping every two years and then making a huge jump every two years right to catch up. I mean, people aren't stupid. Uh, this is a trick that might work once, but I don't, I don't see the rationale in continuing it. But to all your points, these are all very valid things. You know, we set our property taxes too high, and they'll shrug and go, why are they so high? Well, we pay things that Indiana does not pay with their property taxes. We need to talk about that, and we're failing to do so right now. I will say that on the TIF issue that uh, both Illinois Asbo and IESA have created their own team uh, to investigate some of the TIF issues that exist throughout the state and be ready then to represent those issues when the task force begins its work. So your associations are working on your behalf trying to represent those issues in, in a sort of reasonable and effective way and, and really kind of identifying those things that actually could be addressed uh, in terms of policy change and legislative and statutory change. Okay. Hi, I'm Carissa Cashman, and I'm the president of Millbrook District 24 uh, School Board. And I wanted to address the, the looming property tax freeze. During the years of proration, districts were prorated equally, but that was regardless of our funding levels and our adequacy. So because of that, we had to, our, our community that is very school-based and very devoted to our schools passed a, a property tax referendum where in Lake County we're under PTEL. So that was to make up for the lack of state funding. So for us, the formula was a big deal, especially the per district hold harmless. Um, now we're looking at this possible property tax freeze, and unfortunately, that will take away a lot of the additional funding, our referendum, which was a heavy lift, and we were lucky that our community chipped in for it. It's gonna take away a lot of that, and my, I guess my question is, we are funded to 29% from the state, the national average is 44%. The state hasn't done its job for us. Our local community got together and said, we want to pass a referendum because we care about our schools. My question is, if you're still underfunding us, even with the school funding formula, how is it the state's business to take control over local decisions? I can promise you, tax rate. I want to see our community thrive and as a local elected official, the second we're funded to even basic adequacy, I want to freeze those property taxes. But it should be our decision, not the state's. 
So, please share that with us. I think that's a good comment. Anybody want to respond? I mean, I think that. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing nobody on the stage has voted for a property tax freeze. So that's a good, good thing. That doesn't mean it's not going to come up again. There aren't going to be other issues on the table and so forth. But it obviously is a big issue. And I think probably everybody on the stage would shake their head yes, we believe in local control. And we believe in school boards doing a really good job to manage that relationship with the